Nous allons maintenant passer, avec toute l'infrastructure qui est toujours impressionnante avec ces éléments de, de cirque, nous allons passer à la phase des docteurs honoris causa 2010. Et pour ces docteurs honoris causa 2010, nous avons trois euh, lauréats. Je vais appeler Patrick Abicher, notre président, pour remettre ses, euh, ses euh, prix, plutôt ses euh, doctorats. Et puis, I would also like to invite our first laureate, Professor Shirley Jackson, who will be introduced by our Dean of Basic Science, Tom Rizzo. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, it's both a pleasure and an honor for me to present the first of our laureates for Dr. Honoris Causa today, Dr. Shirley Jackson, president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, otherwise known as RPI. It's a particular pleasure for me to make this presentation because um, I myself am a graduate of this uh, fine institution, although uh, 20 years before Dr. Jackson arrived on the scene. Uh, Dr. Jackson is a remarkable person by anyone's measure. Theoretical physicist, university president, and science policymaker, she's blazed a trail at each stage of her career, that, allowing others uh, to follow. She studied physics as an undergraduate at MIT, one of less than 20 African American students at the time, and the only one studying theoretical physics. She stayed at MIT to earn a PhD in, in theoretical particle physics in 1973, being the first African-American woman to receive a doctoral degree from that institution. After postdoctoral positions at prestigious institutions like Fermi National Laboratory, CERN here in Switzerland, and a position teaching at the Stanford Linear, Linear Accelerator, Dr. Jackson became a staff member at the renowned uh, AT&T Bell Laboratories, where she stayed for 15 years. As a scientist, she distinguished herself by mastering very different branches of physics in the tradition of the great masters like Fermi and, and Newton. Her theoretical physics research ranges from elementary particles to semiconductors and magnetism to nanoscience and surfaces. In 1991, she left Bell Labs to take a faculty position at Rutgers University, but she was only there a few years before being appointed by President Clinton to serve as the chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, being the first woman and the first African American to do so. There she had a profound influence on NRC procedures and scope, introducing, uh, introducing rigorous methods for risk assessment. In 1999, Dr. Jackson became the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is the oldest technological university in the United States. In taking this position, she became the first woman to lead a top 50 American research university. Dr. Jackson has received numerous honors and distinctions, of which I will only mention three. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and in, 19, uh, in, in 2001, she was elected as a member of the National Academy of Engineering. She is involved in science policy at the highest levels. In 2008, she became university vice chairman of the U.S. Council of Competitiveness. In 2009, President Obama appointed her to serve on the President's Council of Advisors on, scientific, on Science and Technology, further enhancing the impact that she's had on science policy and on the economy. She serves on the board of directors of many companies and organizations, including IBM, Federal Express Corporation, Medtronic, and she's on the board of trustees of MIT. And if all this weren't enough, she somehow found the time to be both a wife and a, and a mother of one son. Now, in looking over everything that she's accomplished, which, which sort of takes your breath away, I think there are two aspects that make her a particularly good choice for Dr. Honoris Causa uh, at the APFL. In 2005, Time Magazine described her as the ultimate role model for women in science. 
By awarding her this honorary degree today, we at the, P at the APFL join with her in sending a clear message to our own female graduates that there are no limits to what they can achieve when they are motivated and they have an optimistic vision of the future. But there's another reason. There are many similarities and parallels to our two institutions, particularly in the recent history. Dr. Jackson took the reins of RPI less than a year before Patrick Ebersher became president uh, of the APFL. Both are institutions with a tradition of being an eco polytechnique, but they had, which had, uh, had achieved a certain level, but with the potential to go much higher. During her tenure as president of RPI, she had to make the difficult decisions necessary to take her institution to the next level. This required convincing the skeptics among the faculty, the local politicians, and the public of her bold new plan. And this really defines, for me, uh, what leadership is all about. She's delivered on the goals of this plan by raising $1.4 billion in donations to the Institute over a period of 10 years, investing it in creating new faculty positions and constructing and renovating facilities for research, teaching, and student life. The result has been an increase in the Institute's ability to attract top faculty, students, and consequently in its ranking and its reputation among institutions worldwide. Now, doesn't this sound just a bit familiar? Shirley Ann Jackson, more than most, can understand what we've been doing here at the APFL for the last 10 years, and I think we can learn from each other's experience. In addition to being a superb role model, she is, I believe, a kindred spirit. And for this reason, it's particularly appropriate that we award her today the title of Dr. Honoris Causa. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Needless to say, this is a very high honor for me given the parallels between our great institutions. And EPFL is truly a world-class, rising, great institution. I will not take my few minutes to tell you about technology. You know that anyway, and you'll hear more about it. Nor will I take the time to tell you about the difference that you can make in many of the great challenges that face our world in the economy, with disease, with environmental protection, because I think you've learned about that. Instead, I want to talk to you about one simple thing that I have learned over the years, and that is the importance of listening, of really listening. And when you listen, it is important to listen critically. As I'm sure you have learned here, it is important to question someone about his or her supposed facts. When you listen, it is important to listen for tone. If words are delivered with an undercurrent of anger or threat or superiority, be suspicious. There has been much folly created by words delivered with emotion, but with that undertone. But most importantly, the greatest listening, and I'm speaking to the graduates today, is to listen to yourselves to listen to your inner voice. You live and will live in, and work in an environment that is exciting, that is fast-paced, that is moving. And that, mostly, is a good thing, because much creativity can emerge from that kind of cauldron of experience. But it is also important, sometimes, just to be still and just let yourselves be yourselves, because it is then that your true creativity and your true values will be revealed. Thank you again for this high honor. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. It was really wonderful. It's really wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>